Good afternoon, and welcome to Straight Talking with Kelly, where real conversations happen. This is where you will meet some of the most talented, intelligent, and creative people who come to share tips, resources, and knowledge on various topics. My guests come from a magnitude of industries that include education, music, television, community advocates, culinary arts, hospitality, lots and lots of different industries. Today I have with me a music entertainment veteran, Mr. Larry Batiste. Welcome, Larry. Hey, how you doing, Ms. Kelly? <laughs> I'm good. I am so happy to have you here. But before I get into our conversation uh, with Larry, where he's going to talk about his illustrious career in the music industry and how he is passing the torch to aspiring young artists and other music uh, creators. So let me read a little bit about his bio. Oh, give me a moment. So Larry's career in the entertainment industry spans over 40 years. He has worked with some of the most successful, new and legendary artists of all time. He is best known for musical directing the Grammy Awards and the Tech Awards at NAMM. He has a natural talent for understanding and working in all genres of music. So audience, this doesn't really describe his contributions to the music industry. You will hear so much more as we dwell deeper into our conversation. But before we do, I'd like to walk down memory lane with Larry because I met you when I became a board of governors with the Recording Academy. I don't remember what year it was, but I remember I still have my letter, welcome letter from Marianne Zaworski, who I absolutely adore. She's next on my list. Oh, great. <laughs> and then I also, you and I, so not only did we serve as board of governors together, but you, me and Michael Axon, we created the Urban Outreach Committee where we were out there in the communities, educating communities of color about the work that the Grammy does. And we had so much fun, Larry, don't you agree? Oh, we had a wonderful time. <laughs> you know, cause it wasn't uh, any of us, people of color. So, you know, we just loved each other up. <laughs> Every time we exactly. Said, oh exactly. The room. exactly. Oh. No, and then Merle right. Saunders, I think Merle Saunders was the executive director at that time. Yes. And then when then I also served on the advisory board with you over at the SAE Expressions College over in Oakland yeah. with Marianne Zaworski. Again, oh, see, she keeps coming up. I love her. <laughs> and that was Chris. What was Chris's last name? Chris Coladas that actually was the ED over there? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You have a good memory. That's I couldn't. I know it was Chris. But yes, it was Chris Coladas. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So. That was it. And then I remember um, you and I also, I was on the committee with you with Music Cares. Yes. And one of the things that I remember most about you, Larry, after I left the Grammys, I was with the Grammys for like 18 years. Mm -hmm. And after I left, I know that I could always pick up the phone and call you, especially if I knew an artist was struggling with some kind of needing help and stuff. I'm like, hey, Larry, guess what? And you're like, okay, send me their number, give me their email, and you'd reach out to them. So I always know that even though I was no longer a part of the Grammys, that I still had you there. So that was also very heartwarming for me. I really think that's part of our gig and you know, our here on earth is to lift each other up and to help each other live our best lives, you know? And so um, that's what we do. That's just, yeah. you're, you're yeah. the same well, you know what? So, Larry, now we got to get into some of the nitty gritty stuff. I'm sure the audience wants to know where you were born and raised and all that other good stuff. So tell us about that. Well, you know, long story, but I was born in Fairbanks, Alaska. Oh. And, and my story is that um, I ran away at two years old. My parents followed me and we decided to stay. So, but, <laughs> uh, but I grew up in Oakland, California. And, and the truth is that my parents were traveling and for some reason, and my, was, my father wasn't in the military at that time and he wasn't working on the pipeline, but they got to Fairbanks, Alaska and decided to stay and hatch me. I was born there and then they came on, they came on back, you know, there's some sense. Cause I imagine I've been back there just to visit to see where I was born. You know, I took a, a, a gig playing Fats Waller in a play just to see where I was born. And I was wondering why they was paying me so much money. It was in February. And when I got there, it was 60 below. 
And, no. I, and I was there for about 20 minutes and I've said, um, okay, I see where I was born. I'm ready to go back home now. But I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I know I that's right. For two weeks to do the show. And I've been back and forth several times, you know, since then. But, you know, I couldn't imagine what my life would have been. I would have been a hunter or a fisherman or something. So I'm so thankful that I was raised in Oakland, California and uh, you know, to be in this community. And so you, this is going to lead to that very next question. How did you get involved in the music industry? And I know Oakland plays a big part in this. Yes, it's, it's really a long story. But basically, you know, um, I never thought about being in the music industry. I just loved music. And mm -hmm. so I, I started, my first instrument was trombone. I started playing that in the fourth grade. And um, that just evolved into, you know, playing in all the bands, the concert bands, the, the, the bands after school, the jazz bands, the soul dance and all that stuff. And um, then that evolved into me going to school, trying to figure out what I was going to do. You know, you know okay. going to, what are you going to do? And mm -hmm. so uh, I decided to be a music major and, um, that led into uh, me learning all types of things in the music. So part of that program is that each quarter you had to study a different instrument. I didn't know okay. at that time I was being set up to be a musical director, but you know, so you had to take a semester of violin, a semester of flute and all that. But what that did for me was gave me a great understanding of all the different instruments, the violin and their ranges, so I understood how to write for them and, and, and to arrange for that kind of stuff. So you see what I'm leading to? So I ended up being a musical director. So I, exactly. didn't, have any, I, I didn't have any intimidation when it came to, you know, standing in front of a, or, or a bunch of musicians, because although I couldn't play all those instruments, you know, I actually sucked at a lot of those instruments. You know, I couldn't stand to hear myself practice, but I did understand, you know, their their role in the in the in the orchestras and stuff. So, anyway, so that set me up for being able to arrange and and conduct music and you know work with a lot of music musicians. So it sounds like okay, even though you didn't necessarily play all of those instruments and stuff, but you had an ear. Yes. Yeah. You could hear what, I guess, other you know, people. That's all did. God. That's all God. I tell you because um, I could. I sit down and and you know to write a song. I use the piano to write as my instrument, but I could hear all the backgrounds. I hear the you know what the strings are going to play with the horns, the horn arrangements, all that. It's kind of like all up in my head, you yeah. know. As I'm composing, and so that's really a gift. That is truly good. And in all genres, you know, I started off in, you know, playing, of course, jazz and R&B. Um, uh, but then when I got to, um, you know, college, I, I my, my, uh, my, my instructor, well, I, I was a trombone major. And he says, oh, I see you play jazz, you play whatever. He's, and I said, yeah, I was really proud. He said, don't worry, we'll fix that. I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> I said, oh, my God. And so I basically dropped those genres of music for a few years. And I uh, studied classical music and um, went to a whole nother thing. And most of my friends, you know, I was the only black person in the room most of the time. So I got into rock, you know, rock concerts and all that and learned to love all the genres of music. And as long as it was excellent and, and I, I just found the jewel in all genres of music, you know, and so, and that was a gift. And, and then I was able to return to, you know, me, you know, my music is like driving, but I definitely gave me a great understanding and appreciation of all genres of music. So. You know, when you were describing how you could hear all of the different instruments and you know how the sound goes when, when you're writing this stuff, Michael Jackson was like that. Yes, absolutely. Michael Jackson. Yeah. So when you said that, I was like, and, and that's death. It is a gift. And the mm -hmm. simple fact that you understand that it's a God given gift yeah. and that you use it, I think this is a beautiful thing. Yeah, it really is. Because I hear stories of, uh, you know, Michael, you know, although he couldn't play any instruments, you know, he would um, have the musicians come over his house and he would go, doom, 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 doom. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? He would, you know. Exactly. Would, you, know, you know, and put it all together, you know, so that's amazing. He would be the instruments. Now, so the other thing that I remember about you is that, so after you got out of school and started doing things, you your recording career started like in what, 1979 when you were with Bill Summers? Tell me about yeah, that. It, 
Well, actually, um, you know, I was in college and I uh, and I got introduced to Bill Summers, you know, through I think it was Bill Bell who told Bill Summers about Clay Tobin and myself. He wanted, you know, I don't know if people know who Bill Summers is. He's a major, you know, percussionist. And um, he was part of the, he did all the drum work and percussion work for the miniseries Root. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Percussion. You know, people running through the jungle, he would create all the, the African okay. sounds. Oh, okay. Actually, the, ooh, 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 ooh. That, that, that's, that was all Bill Summers. And okay. um, so he, he was so successful there. Uh, he went on to join the Herbie Hancock band as part of the Headhunters and got his own record deal. Now he needed to write songs and he needed to partner with um, some other people. And that was Clay Tone and myself. So we had a great career. We did a record for Fantasy Records. And then we signed a major, more major label to, with MCA. And so mm -hmm. we co-produced and co-wrote all of the albums, you know, for, for that situation. It was great. Wow. Yeah. And you've worked with some wonderful people. Um, I know you've worked with Whitney Houston. You've yeah. worked with um, Patty Austin, Al Jarreau. I mean, yes. the list goes on. And then we won't even talk about, we haven't even got to the part where you, you know, being the music director of the Grammys, because just think how many people you met there. Yeah, uh, and so, you know, so that's why I told the audience, you know what, guys, we'd, we were just touching touching a little bit on his career with the bio that I read, but the more we talk, the more they'll get to understand just how deep in the music industry you really are. Yeah. So now tell me this. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a screening at Skywalker, Skywalker Studios with Leslie Ann Jones when I was a board of governors where they took us to see the musical Rent. Ah, yes. Uh -huh. I re you know, I, I remember that and I was like, oh my God, Larry and Clay Tobin were singing, you guys were singing in that. Yeah, that was really pretty amazing. Although in the end, we didn't, our credit never appeared, you know, but. <laughs> and but I know that you guys were in it. Yes. Oh, baby, we were in it and we got paid and we did all the stuff, but they just forgot that part. But that was an incredible experience. A friend of mine called me and she told me about it. They said they're looking for singers but beyond that they're looking for somebody to contract all the singers they're going to do the, the 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 soundtrack here and and so i ended up being the contractor uh, on that gig and for those who don't know that means that i hired all the vocalists involved in that recording and then was able to perform on it as well so that was incredible experience I had a chance to hire all my friends uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> and so we went on down to Skywalker Ranch and that was that was great. I love the musical and um so great experience. Yeah, yeah, and it was a great musical. I love that musical. Yeah. Now I know that the Oakland Symphony also commissioned you to compose and orchestrate some of their compositions. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, that came about because um Mike Morgan with the uh, Oakland Symphony, um, they had this grant. Um, for composers who are not uh, composers of classical music. They don't have the track record of that. And so they called on me to be an advisor and, and to, uh, to help them find artists, you know, and composers. Oh, okay. And so I, you know, I recommended Patrice Russian one year. Then another year, um, they called me and I, I recommended Marta Michael Walden with Carlos Santana. And so that was the, 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 the point of the program, people who don't normally do classical music. So probably about the third or fourth year when they called me, um, I figured they was going to you know, they're looking for another recommendation. So I had a whole list already of people to recommend. But then they said, no, no, we want to commission you. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. So wow. I said, what? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so that was another exciting time. And of course, I called my musical partner in crime, Clay Tobin. And we both did compositions. And um, that was really the coolest thing about that is actually hearing all these things in your head, like I talked about before, you know, happening when it comes to fruition, you know, and, um, you know, we was using this program to really put things together, but, um, and the, but to actually hear the strings, everything being played, it was like, oh, it just brings you to tears. And, yes. it's, and, and most of the time, you know, we're dealing with people who don't have budget. Yeah. 
So you might have an eight piece band or a 13 piece band, but I'm trying to figure out now what the piccolo is going to play and what the oboe is <laughs> going to play. And I, I mean, I have all been, oh, there's a cello. I'm going to just, just things that you never have access to, you know, when composing. And uh, what's the timpani going to play and all yeah. that kind of stuff. So that was a real interesting process and uh, just something that I will never forget. I'm just grateful. It was the full orchestra with, uh, I think it was 200 voices. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's so, a lot. That's a lot. So, Larry, there are so many layers to your talent, and I want to touch on as many as I possibly can. So talk to me about your work as a songwriter and producer. Um, That's a lot. <laughs> I have a lot. <laughs> well, just a little bit. Just give me a little bit. Just to, just to give the audience a little taste. Like, yeah. tell me, what's behind you? What are, what are these gold records behind you? Well, there are different projects I've been involved with. And um, either I've been singing on the project or I've written or arranged something on the project. And, and I don't really think about it much. It's, I'm just going, you know, I'm just feeding people. I'm keeping the family fed and I'm, you know, <laughs> and I'm being creative and all that. So it's nice to look at every once in a while, just to remember. You oh, know, absolutely. And well, so you earn that. Yeah, well, I just go forward. You know, I just keep, you know, um, knock out one thing and I go, okay, what's next and do that. And so I'm really concerned mainly with just trying to evolve, trying to be relevant, trying to be creative, trying to live a good, meaningful life. You know, I never really want to reach the top because what is that? You know, once you get to the top, there's nowhere to go. But, zoo, but coming yeah. back down, that's right. It's like, you know what? <laughs> I want so to stay level. To, yeah, I Can I stay it. level? <laughs> I ain't trying to reach no top. You know, <laughs> I'm just trying to be creative and evolve and try to bring people along with me, trying to learn from, you know, the young folks and, and everybody around, because that's what we do. We share information. We Absolutely. lift each other up and we live our best lives, you know. Now, okay, so you've been involved with the Grammys in so many different capacities. Yes. You know, uh, so I want you to talk a little bit about that and then how it led to you becoming now a national trustee. Yeah, it started off, you know, um, number one, I, I probably, I'm the probably the number one volunteer in the Bay Area. If it has something to do with kids, uh, education, or, or, or something like that, I'm pretty much on board. I sit on four or five boards and it all has to do with advocating for after school programs, you know, instrument drives, things like that. And um, so I joined the Recording Academy over three years ago and um, someone invited me, but when I got there, I realized I didn't see me and uh, there. I mean, there was no people of color really. I was all the events were rock and roll and, and stuff, so I kind of, hung around for a year or two and I'm going, well, let's do something where um, I could get people involved, people who are into R&B and people in the jazz or whatever. And I thought, you know, an event we could have uh, where there's a common thread along all genres is learning about songwriting and publishing. And so mm -hmm. uh, I partnered with a guy named uh, Hillel Resner who had the same dream. And um, we did an event um, and we, at that time, I think it was the 80s or maybe in the 90s, and the high groups were Tony, 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 and Gold, and people like that. And so um, we put together an event around publishing and writing, but you know, we had to have some, um, some judging and some people bringing their songs because, you know, everybody listens to that same radio station, uh, W-I-F-M. You know, what's in it for me, right? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm so, thinking you're getting ready to say a real radio station and you're talking. <laughs> but you know, it's like you have to, people have to have an opportunity to showcase their music while yes. they're learning. And yes. then, you know, us Black folks, we got to have some food. So I got people, <laughs> you know, we had the chicken going on and the whole That's thing. That's right. And then we got an opportunity for people to be seen and heard. And then we had an opportunity to share some information about yes. what they were doing. So it ended up being a very successful event. We were sold out. I think it's, I don't know if you remember Kimball's East. or Yes, or, I do. Or, yes. And so we had it there and um, the event was so successful. I just kind of 
you to put a spotlight on me. And um, and before you know, they were asking me to be president, to run for president of the chapter. <laughs> so, and I was the first black president to be, you know, that type of thing. And so that's what started kind of like the Grammy career, but that's that's where I volunteer another point of uh, volunteering. Uh, what's key with that or with that a particular event is the guy I mentioned, Hello Resner. Okay. Hello Resner uh, created a magazine called Mix Magazine, and, and which is a, like a Bible for engineers and, and things like that. And so that's, you know, I didn't know him before this, but that's what he does. Now the day after we uh, did that event, he said, how would you like to be? He says, I produce a show called the Tech Awards. I didn't know what the oh. Tech Awards was. He okay. said, I'm oh, the musical director of the Tech Awards. Uh, we got along so well that he invited me to musical direct that show. Now I said, well, I didn't know anything about it, but I understood it was a job. Now, the other thing about this is that he didn't know anything about my music. He never heard my songs. He never seen oh, wow. me. He never, but, but just based on him liking me oh, yeah. and, and we getting along so well, he just knew that I could do this job. So I didn't know what it was. So he says, well, let's have lunch tomorrow. I went to lunch and he hands me this script. And I read the script and it says, then David Letterman comes on and does, and then it says- Oh my hey, goodness. Okay, all, all these huge people. <laughs> then, so I said, are these people going to be there? <laughs> <laughs> he, he says, yes. <laughs> and so and so. anyway- um, it's, How it's awesome long. is that? That is so awesome. And I'm sorry for making it so long, but this is really the beginning of my career as being a musical director. And it's all- because of relationships. And that's yes. a very important I want to make with your audience is that your network is your net worth. And so mm -hmm. um, the plant me in that position, now the show was in New York. I didn't know anybody in New York. And, uh, but there's one guy who I'd met a year before and he was at the Circle Star, uh, if you remember that theater. And he yes. was playing bass for Luke Brandros. Oh. We met and we became really good friends. Now, by this time, he had become musical director for a group called Steely Dan. So I was like, I don't know anybody but Tom Barney that lives in New York. So I called Tom Barney. I said, look, I got this gig in New York. Can you put together a band for me? And so he said, sure. And so he puts together my band. I'm all set. I do the charts here and, you know, get to uh, the New York. And um, when I get there, my house band is Steely Dan. Wow. I'm going, oh my God. <laughs> you know? Wow. I can't believe it. And wow, so, that's uh, awesome. Bam was incredible. And uh, so many other things great happened that solidified me having that gig. I did that gig for a few years. And of course, the Recording Academy, which is the Grammys, uh, was they were sponsors of the Tech Awards. And when they got ready to replace Patrice Russian as musical director of the Grammy Pretail, they just called me and wow. said, hey, I was already volunteering. They see my work with Tech Awards and they just asked me, did I want to do the gig? And wow. so, the, yeah, so. Amazing, it's, it's, absolutely. It's, it's, I mean, you know what? It's kind of like like what you said, being at the right place at the right time, yeah. but also having a personality that can bring people to you, to bring people to you. And yeah, the simple fact that you, and you have that, Larry, where you're very genuine, uh, you're very giving, you're very open, and you're very helpful, resourceful. So all of those things matter. I, yeah, I think it's right. It's the power of attraction and just people already knowing your personality, knowing that you're going to show up, you're going to do what you say you're going to do. If you can't yep. do it, you can tell them you can't do it. You know, it's all the yep. same that your mama taught you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just, yeah, common decency. Absolutely. <laughs> Wow. So now, now, so like I said, so you work with the Grammys and with the Tech Awards. So what is it like being a national trustee? What does that entail for you? Well, that is basically um, being a fiduciary of the organization, um, you know, making financial decisions, reading um, uh, proposals for people who want to change things or whatever and, and weighing all these decisions and kind of running the um, organization and, and their business. And, and you know, I had taken um, five years off of 
being involved with the Recording Academy up until June of 2020. Okay. And uh, I, I, I uh, thought I was going to finish my book and, and hadn't finished it anyway. So I said, <laughs> I said let me put my hat in the ring you know, <laughs> and do that. But I tell you, um, so I was cool with just with us so I could be involved, involved again. And then, but I decided to run for trustee. Um, and I started this past June because we're at a great time in the Recording Academy. You know, when you and I were involved in working together, it was a bit of a struggle, you know, and um, and I think that the, we are got great new leadership now. I know, you know, the Harvey Mason Jr. is now the CEO. So there's more action. There's more, he's really progressive. We have a department for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And under Wonderful. that umbrella, we've started the Black Music Collective. Oh, which, nice. Um, yeah, for the advancement of Black music creators and, you know, we're, we're having events for health and wellness, you know, it's you know, all those things that you and I kind of talked about that wasn't the right time at that time, yes. but now the time yes. is perfect, you know, to be inclusive, you know, that's also uh, having a more inclusive staff and uh, in the membership working on that as well. So I'm not a spokesman for the Recording Academy, so I can't really get too deep with them, but I can only tell you why I, you know. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. The timing, the timing is right. And we have people in power in the right positions and the right board to actually make things happen, you know, to put things in action. And so, so it's time for me to come back then. I'm coming you, back. And besides that, because of COVID, um, they're having uh, people come back and and the, the membership fee is waived, you know, till I don't know how long it's going to be waived because of COVID. And so this is a really good time to come back. This round with my uh, tenure as trustee, I, I'm advocating for certain things, you know, and okay. that is uh, number one this year, artists with disabilities. Okay. And, and so um, I... I so that's the whole thing that's in the works and in progress and we're having events and stuff. And then that's gonna lead in for me uh, is artists with uh, mental illness. Nice. And so I think that's, um, that platform, I'm old now. So like I'm all past all the whatever. I'm, I really just wanna do stuff that counts and that helps people. And I don't think I know anyone um, that doesn't know anyone that doesn't deal with mental illness either in their family or their friends or whatever. Uh, my yes. office is at West Grand and um, in Northgate and downtown Oakland. I see it all the time. Yes, you know? yes. And so, um, so there's a stigma behind that. And um, we need to just address that. We need to try to find a way to, to uh, be inclusive and, and, and when we're trying to help people, is help is not just for the rich and successful people. You know, I yeah. mean, we have like the Demi Lovato's and whoever, they could have a breakdown and whatever, um, go into a hospital, come back and get a book deal. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know absolutely. This doesn't yeah, and happen for the, the independent, you know, artists or whatever. So we need to uh, have more conversation, have more awareness and really help one another to get better and find yeah. that. So anyway, I could go on. Well, no, I agree, you know, because I, I actually have been a volunteer with the National Alliance for Mental Illness with NAMI yeah, for years exactly. because I totally, I get it. And then like right now, I have, um, I interviewed uh, one of my girlfriends, Asante, who's working on Alzheimer's. So there's just yeah. a lot of things that happen. Yeah. Um, and so the simple fact that you're embracing that with the Grammys, I think it's awesome. So I am coming back. I will yeah, renew my membership back, now. Because this time, when you, if you have a platform or anybody with resources behind you, I think that's yeah. the kind of work we should be doing. And that's where they're on the same path, too. That's what they're Yeah, trying I think to it's beautiful. Here. It's wonderful. So it's a really yes. good time to be back with them. No, oh, that's great. So you got me coming back. I'm coming back. At I'm coming back. Now, so Larry, share with me how you're passing the torch by working with aspiring artists and other music creators. Um. Wow. How am I doing that? Well, I think it's just maybe in my advocacy work. I, I also mentor through the Recording Academy. So I have one student 
every semester or every period, you know? And, okay. uh, but thing is, they never go away. <laughs> 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 so, so I am the uncle to maybe 30 folks. Okay. So when I say, oh, well, my mentoring part time is over. I said, well, okay. you know, I get rid of me, you know, and so I stay in touch with everybody. I try to hook them up with internships and I try to give them all the, the information I can and yeah. uh, just try to partner them with people who are doing what they're trying to do, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 it's good. I, well, I, I know for years, I was also on the committee with you with Grammy in the schools. Are they still yeah. doing Grammys in the schools? They are now. It's part of the. It's called Career Day, okay. And, and it's run by the Grammy Museum, and I, I don't know how that came about, but I just did something for them on May. I think it was May nineteenth. Of course, okay. it was online, where you know they pick schools and you're online like Zoom, like we are, and you're mentoring and just you know fielding questions and stuff and trying to inspire them and point them in the right direction. That's beautiful. Yeah. So now, Larry, we're going to segue out of your music career and get a little personal. Uh -oh. So I want you to tell me three people that have inspired you. Oh, uh, wow. Only three? Yes. Um, <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I have been inspired by so many. I think I start with my music teachers, you know, with uh, Bill Bell, uh, um, who taught instrumental music. I started off as a trombone player who just totally embraced me, mentored me, and, and Clay Tobin. And, you know, it did things like when we were in the 12th grade, he says, um, do you have a suit? And I go, yeah. OK, mm -hmm. I want you to show up at so-and-so place with your suit on and your trombone. And um, we get there, and it's Billy X time. We say, oh, oh my God. goodness. Wow. <laughs> and then we show up again, and it's Eartha Kitt. We go, oh, my God. <sighs> You know what I mean? And so what he was doing was he was in us and although we were in high school, he was showing us that this was possible, you know? Yeah. So that, that did so much for, for me. You know, I believe that I could be successful because Bill Bell told me I could. Mm. <laughs> you know? Nice. And, and Very that's nice. all I want to do for other people. And um, the, the vocal person was Phil Reader. I was a part of, I went to Castlemont High School. We had the Castleers. And with that group, we traveled to Europe in the 12th grade and all this. This showed me that travel was possible. I could get out of Oakland. I could do, and people would embrace you and all that. Then I had a, a mentor of this Jewish guy named Jeffrey Graubart. When Clay Tobin and I was in the 12th grade, we we started our publishing company. We said, well, we need to talk to somebody that knows something. We need to, you know, find an attorney to talk to. And so we looked up the biggest attorney that was happening in uh, the Bay Area. And this guy was Jeffrey Graubart. And he was the attorney for uh, Janis Joplin, Journey Santana, and all the big people. Now, we little two little Black kids. You know, we think, <laughs> we got so we called him up, you know, and he took our call and made an appointment with us. Wow. So we um so we saved up $125. We said this should be enough. Mm -hmm. And we uh we went on in and when he uh, we got in that office, he had a big office in Ghirardelli Square, and he kind of chuckled when he saw us because he thought we were like, you know, adults and we were like right, right. with big briefcases, briefcases were bigger than us <laughs> <laughs> with nothing in it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you had the look, you had that look. <laughs> So he looked at us and we told him what we wanted to do. We want to start a publishing company. This man was so nice to us. He took the day off. He told his secretary to, to, to cancel all his appointments. He talked to us about the ins and out of the business and what we should look for in a contract and all this type of stuff. So he was the business, he was the business mentor, you know, and I'm telling you, at the end of the day, he took us to lunch. And then at the end of the day, I said, um, sir, how much do we owe you? And he said, ah. That's all right. You guys are really going places. We just forget it. I said, no, 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 because 125 was burning my pocket. Wait, you you, you you saved that money, right? Right. I was, I was ready <laughs> to pay. You know? and so he said, Are you sure? And I said, Yeah, I'm sure. He said, Well, are you sure? I said, Yeah. He said, Okay, seven hours times $375. I went, mm, I just <laughs> <laughs> I had to back down. I, I cleared my throat. 
you know, I said, oh, second hand, sir, we just gonna, you know, take you up on your offer. But, you know, he was so nice. He called us like once a month and said, okay, what are you working on? Let me see Aww. that. Back. Let me and guide Oh, beautiful. So, you know, he was just so many, you know, he was a mentor in that way. Um, you know, and then later on, when I got a chance to meet with Jones, you know, he was another one to, you know, just so nice. And, um, you know, what was his name again? Who was his next person that you said? Quincy Jones. Oh, Quincy Jones. Oh, Quincy. Too. <laughs> so I'm at an event and I see Quincy Jones. And I said, oh my God, it's Quincy Jones. And so I asked his handler, you know, could I meet him? He said, sure. When that person stops talking to him, just go over there. Went over there, introduced myself. And um, now we have the common link because of Bill Summers and he did the the soundtrack to Roots, which Quincy Jones produced, and blah, blah, blah. Ah, oh, okay. Over, introduced myself, and he held my hand. You know, he shook my hand, but it felt like 10 minutes. He probably was about 30 seconds, but it felt like a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was so nervous. And I just wanted to introduce myself because I finally, you know, had met him and stuff. But he started talking to me. He started saying, um, so what are you working on? You know, and I told him what I was working on, and I told him I was producing whatever the singer was. And he started telling me about it. Well, I'm producing this guy named James Ingram. I'm going, okay, I know him. And so he says, well, you know, what you got to do is remember not to polish the shine off of your, the, the performance. You know, some people are always trying to get it so correct that you never get the right feeling. The same right. thing again with the, the artist originally sang with. So that was great advice. And then he asked me something else. Now, my, this time I'm like, I'm going crazy because I can't believe I'm talking. To, he's actually talking, having a conversation, you know. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know. I probably sound like a fool because, like, I'm so busy thinking, like, he's talking to me. He's asking me questions. You I know. know, that's right. Isn't that wonderful? I, I, I'm, I'm all in between my head and stuff. So I, I that was just so nice. He gave me some great advice. And the next time he gave me great advice again, and then it, it kept going on and on every time we met. And so he didn't, he doesn't know it, but he's a mentor. Okay. That's <laughs> awesome. That is awesome. So now Larry, when I go back and name the three people that you named again, so it was Bill. I said Bill Bell slash Phil Reader, which was my high school teachers. Okay. Um, and I would say Jeffrey Graubard. Okay. The lawyer. With the lawyer. And I would say um, Quincy Jones. And I okay. also would have to say, include my business partner, Clay Tobin, because- That's what I was getting ready to say. I was going to bring him up. I was going to say that you talked about Clay Tobin through this whole thing. And Clay Tobin I mean, is Clay, awesome. You know why? Because um, I'll be 65 in a few uh, weeks. And okay. I met Clay Tobin when I was 10. Wow. You guys <laughs> go so, way back. Way back. And so in terms of just genius, we met- in, um, uh, in a competing bands, you know, in a battle of the bands back in the day. And I, we, I met this guy and we became friends. I think we did win, but they came in <laughs> second. And, um, but, and realized that he lived really close to me. And oh, so okay. we, we started connecting and we just have this talent and but just really, he's inspired by my talent. I'm inspired by his talent. And it's amazing that after, how many years is that? 45 years, wow. 65 years. That's that beautiful. We, we are still friends and, you know, I have the publishing company still and all this type of stuff. But you yeah. guys are more than friends. You guys are family now because you guys, your kids family. go grew up together and yeah. Yeah. So you guys are definitely family now. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a family affair. Most definitely. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now I would like for you to tell me what would the nine year old Larry say to the grown man, Larry today? Um, I would say, pay attention. I, um, I, I would say, um, pay attention. And I was a pretty good kid, though. You know, music, um, I think music, like they say, uh, a mind is a terrible to waste or what thing, the, whatever the slogan is. Yeah, a mind is but, a terrible thing to waste. Yes. Yeah, yeah but um, being busy keeps you out of trouble. You know, I, I grew up in the hood. I grew up in Brookfield, you know, in Oakland, California. And, um, you know, I, on my way to school, I walked by winos and stuff like that every day and all this kind of stuff. And one thing I did know is I didn't want to be one of them, but I yeah. was too busy 
to be in trouble, you know? Uh, so I was always in a band, I always had rehearsal, I always had a whatever. And so I was really too busy doing this thing to, uh, to, to get in trouble, to get in kind of mischief. And so that's just a blessing. I'm going, God, why me? You know, there's so many people that don't find, find their niche. You know, yeah. I think that there's something for everybody, but you have to find it, recognize it, and then really make the best of it. And yeah. so, um, so, but I think, I, I think I did pretty good in terms of, but it was really music that really saved me, I think, from all the stuff that I could have gotten into. And yeah. I, I just feel so blessed because I'll tell you where I come from. And when I'm sitting off somewhere in some wonderful place, I'm going like, Hmm. <laughs> okay, this, I did. Oh, I did good. You're like, this, I did all right. I did yeah. okay. You know, and, and, and it's not me, and I recognize that it's not me. You know, it is definitely uh, God who's got me here. So that's beautiful. So now, as we get ready to wrap up, is there anything you would like to say to the listening audience? And actually, what you just said was very wonderful. But I'm sure there's something else you can say to them. But I think the listening and following your passion. Is key. Yeah, I think yeah, following your passion is is really it. But I think that anybody who wants to have a career in entertainment industry or probably any industry, you know, I would say uh, become an expert at something, at whatever mm -hmm. you're known for, so that you know when people putting out their money, they know that they are, you know, they're paying for something. What will people pay for? Yeah. You know, and so that means that you have, if you're a singer, if you're a musician, if you're a manager or whatever you are, become an expert at that. So yeah. you can be at the top of your game. And the thing is, um, we have multiple talents, but don't spread yourself too thin. You know, become an expert at something and then develop all the rest of the skills. You know, um, become a great listener and communicator. You know, I have a friend who, does he does song placement in films and stuff like that. And something he told me, he says, you know, most of the time composers want to show off, you know, what they could do. But if the director is asking for a peanut butter jelly sandwich, don't give him a steak. You okay. know, because <laughs> to show you, hey, I can make a steak. But that's not what he's looking for. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so and so so be a good listener, be a good communicator. Um be responsible and all those things that your mama taught you. And then lastly, I would say find a mentor. Find somebody that you can trust and share your dream with them. And, um, you know, I think those are the the, the key things. Um, be a joiner. You know, success doesn't happen in isolation. You know, your network is your net worth. So, you know, it's about, it's powerful when you can pick up the phone and call somebody and make something. Absolutely. Not only for yourself, but for other people and yes. for, for your causes. So, you know, that's what I've learned, you know, over the years. I was basically a very shy person, believe it or not. I was so satisfied with just coming, showing up in a room, checking it out and leaving. But I realized I wasn't really accomplishing anything, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so and you get home, you go like, hmm, I should have told him that I did this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, should have, could have, would have. Should have, could have, would have. Yeah, Absolutely. So yes. I had to learn. I had to learn how to do that. I had to learn how to go to a workshop and really learn something about the person that was putting on the panel, so I can have a conversation with them. Other than, hey, I really like your stuff. It's really cool. But I could walk up to the musician and say, you know, I really like that song. You know, on your album. You know, the third cut. You know, and I like the way you went to that bridge. You know, why did you go to B flat instead of G? Blah, blah, blah. And then they know that I know something about them or whatever, and you develop in a meaningful relationship and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, so I had to learn those things. That's beautiful. I think it's wonderful. I think that you have had such an illustrious career that has given you the opportunity now where you can just sit back and give back. And that's what you're doing. Yeah. So you, you're you no longer climbing that ladder to 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 to, to grab that brass record because you already got it. So now you can just sit back and really be of help and service to others. Now, how can the audience reach you if they want to be in touch with you? Well, I'm on Facebook a lot. I'm you know, I, I've, I'm writing a book and you'll hear about that later. 
Um, okay. but so my, my publisher tells me I need to be on Instagram. I have an Instagram account, but I'm too busy to use okay. it. You know? Sure. <laughs> so yeah, so I mean, Facebook is so Facebook is it basically. Facebook is basically it. And my email address is I don't know if you could put that somewhere. But well, you know what? It it'll actually be in your when I post the, the video. Uh huh. They'll have that information. They'll have your contact information there. Those are the best ways. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, Larry, it has been such a pleasure having you on here. So when that book comes out, we have to have you back. Yes, absolutely. We'll definitely have to have you back. And uh, you and I will be in touch because I think I will become a member again, especially since I'm getting back into the music industry. I'm going to be doing my artist development here soon. You know, so, Kelly, Kelly, I want to thank you for um, your contributions to, to you, to fashion, to images, you know, it's all connected, you yeah. know, and yeah. you're, you're, you're the godmother of love. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm very much like you where uh, young adults and youth have been my focus throughout my career, yes. making sure that I'm constantly bringing people along. You know, I started that culinary program over at the Bayview Y, mm -hmm. then I'm in the fashion department. So just being able, and then being in music. So I think fashion, music, and uh, culinary arts are all entertainment as far as, that's how I see it. Exactly, and now more than ever. And yeah. now it's all, it's all connected, so. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, we're going to do some stuff together. I know it's happening. So I would like to thank you again for being on Straight Talking with Kelly, where real conversations happen. And audience, let's say goodbye to Mr. Larry Batiste. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Bye.